if you do any prospecting with LinkedIn, you have got to go get set up with Surf. That's S U R F E. It's a tool you can use to add new contacts to your CRM system directly from LinkedIn in seconds. I'm using it every single day. I add contacts, follow my deals, keep track of notes, and it ends up saving me a bunch of time on prospecting and outreach, which means I can spend more time moving my deals along. The data is always 100% accurate since I don't have to copy and paste all the fields over from each and every contact that I want to put in my CRM. Instead, Surf does that all automatically with just one click in about 60 seconds. The team over at Surf has put together a very special offer for fans of sales players. There's a link down in the show notes and you can use the promo code JWSurf5. Don't forget the E at the end of Surf. That's JWSurf5 for 5% off your first year. Don't spend another minute doing things manually. Go get set up with Surf. I'm excited to bring you today's guest, Brandon Fluharty. Now, Brandon needs almost no introduction. If you're following any sales content out there on LinkedIn, Twitter, or anywhere else, you've probably already seen posts that Brandon's put out. He has a personal operating system for driving success in SaaS sales, and the proof is in the pudding. He's actually done eight figures in SaaS revenue over the last couple of years and personally netted himself seven figures in income. How do I know that? He posted his W-2 on LinkedIn. You can go check it out. In this episode, he shares uh, his story, his background, how he got to where he is now, which is an amazing transformation. He shares some details around that personal operating system that he uses to maintain his mental health, physical health, and ultimately be a top performer in the industry. He really thinks of himself as an athlete, and he thinks salespeople are the athletes of the business world, and that we should take care of our uh, wellness and health, and that's how you drive the most success. And then we also get into his open letter strategy, which is a play that he runs to crack into the world's top enterprise brands. And this is a tactic I'm going to use myself for my prospecting. So with that, I want to introduce Brandon and welcome him to the show. Brandon, what's up, man? Hey, Jesse. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Thanks for, for coming on. I'm super excited. Uh, you're one of the, the LinkedIn thought leaders and you know just SaaS sales thought leaders that I follow religiously. Uh, I probably like and comment, I try to anyway, on every post you put out there. So uh, I am so glad we're getting this episode on the books and can't wait for you to share your story, your playbook with uh, the SaaS sales players. Yeah, love it. I feel like we already know each other <laughs> through LinkedIn. So yeah, can't wait to jump into this. Fantastic. So I want to start off just digging in a little bit into your background. So how did you find yourself in this crazy world of, of SaaS selling? Uh, when I did my research, it looks like you came from a media background. I know from listening to other podcasts you've been on that you come from an ath uh, athletic background. Uh, but tell us uh, you know, a little bit of your origin story. Uh, I'd love to learn about uh, how, you, how you landed in this business. Yeah, it uh, certainly wasn't deliberate uh, or intentional, at, at least at the start. And it's been a long, winding road. Uh, so, yeah, I started as an aspirational professional soccer player, played collegiately, uh, had the opportunity to go spend some time in Europe. Uh, I was in Romania off the beaten path a bit with the first division club there, uh, trying to win a, a contract, spent a little time in England. Uh, unfortunately, ran into some injury issues, but actually learned a lot around just focus and the discipline of, of trying to be a professional athlete and kind of harnessing that and taking that into the professional business world and particularly sales. So I sort of started out my career when you know, I couldn't play. I started with actually a soccer education startup uh, in New York, uh, in, in Long Island. And I didn't really know I was selling, but I was getting my sales education <laughs> through that. Yeah. I was selling small packages of um, you know, personal training, small group training. And then I um, had the, the aspiration to, to move into New York City, work in New York City. So I, I followed another passion of mine. Your, your audience can't see it, but in the background, I have a, a DJ table. I was really into sort of music and teaching myself how to DJ so I could pay my New York City rent. And yeah. um, I linked up with a company that uh, was in music marketing, essentially. So we would use DJs to mix music for the likes of Gucci and um, Crunch Fitness. And wow. 
So I was selling those solutions. And that was like my first time really in sales. And then my, my wife and I, we had the opportunity to, to leave New York and um, settle in a, a small town in, in Florida, Sarasota, where she grew up. And I really kind of had to start over. Um, and I got into media sales, selling print advertising, and then into eventually television advertising. And then after television advertising, had the opportunity to kind of get into to, to SaaS sales around uh, 2012 and started at the SMB level and then eventually found my way uh, to live person uh, into strategic sales, kind of selling into to Fortune 500 companies uh, about four years ago. So one of the most common questions I get from my listeners is, okay, right now I'm selling media or I sell, uh, I don't know, commercial construction equipment or medical devices or something like that. How do I get into the cloud computing business? Because every time I go apply for a SaaS job, they tell me I don't have any SaaS experience, even though I may have three, four, five years of sales experience or even more. I've actually talked to to folks with, you know, 10 years of selling fitness equipment uh, commercially and they go and apply for a software role and they get, you know, turned away because they don't have any, you know, tech experience. Yeah. How did you parlay your, it sounds like you've done a lot of different things, uh, including the DJ stuff, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it sounds like all of that sort of helped round you out as someone that could land in a, in a software company and not only, you know, not only thrive there, but I think, you know, I think it's safe to say you've probably risen to the top of this industry in some form of fashion, some form of fashion, and you're one of the top players in the space. So what advice would you give someone out there who's in a media sales role in a, you know, commercial medical device role or something trying to transition into SaaS? Yeah. Uh, here's how I did it. We're humans first, seller second. So what I would say is, identify what makes you uniquely you as a human being, right? There are things that we can parlay into whatever it is we've sold. And you need to become your best advocate. You need to become your own uh, sales athlete, your professional athlete and your agent. That's sort of what's unique about sales is, you know, we don't have agents representing us. So you have to be that person yourself. Mm -hmm. And so how do you sell yourself? Well, you, you need to do that through stories and you need to do that through creative ways of how you break into companies, just like you would break into an account. Um, mm -hmm. You've done it through unique ways. So you can use technology and we have so much technology from Vidyard to Loom, you know, do a video on LinkedIn and Sales Navigator. There are all these interesting ways to weave your story to make it relevant and just as you would win a deal, you'd want to win over a company to say, hey, I'm uniquely positioned to succeed in SaaS because I know your industry. And here's how I did it. Um, so I was selling television advertising, but knew, right, at, it, that wasn't the future, right? Everything was moving, especially at the time, uh, local businesses were moving away from, you know, advertising in the newspaper, advertising on local television station to digital marketing solutions, search engine marketing and, and building their websites and so forth. So what I did was show, hey, I actually have a, a, a network of highly compelling businesses who want to transfer their television dollars into digital. So immediately I can make an impact because I know the, the, the local business landscape. I know how much they're spending on television. I can help bring that into digital solutions. So I was in a complementary industry, media, but I wasn't yeah. selling SaaS. I was selling something very traditional, but I had the network and expertise to say, hey, I can parlay this into. The easy part is learning the technology, right? The hard part is having an immediate network of business, right, mm -hmm. that I can bring to the table. So I would say find your complement, like be, use your expertise in where you are today, but find the top SaaS players in your immediate adjacent industry mm -hmm. and start there. Then you can grow once you're in the SaaS industry. That's what I did. That's, uh, I, I love that story and advice. I know a lot of people who 
were you know working in hospitality or travel and then transitioned by jumping into a SaaS company that served the hospitality and travel industry, right? So yes. uh, I think that's dead on. Find what your experience, where your experience is and where it does add value. And it'll be a lot easier to make the jump. And to your point, the, the challenging part isn't really learning the, the tech. That'll come with time and exposure and repetitions. Uh, the, the challenging thing is trying to figure out exactly where you can add that most, that, you know, the most value to a software company. Exactly. That's it. Awesome. So I want to circle back to something I mentioned earlier. You, you know, first of all, you're putting out a lot of content on LinkedIn. Uh, and what I love about it is that you're, you're raging against the machine that is the sort of hustle culture in this business. And it's something that I've been thinking about for a long time. And I've had, you know, personal experience with from my first SaaS job all the way until, you know, recently. <laughs> uh, tell us about, you know, some thoughts you have on how to still be successful in SaaS selling, uh, without having to, you know, essentially harm your personal health, your mental health, you have a lot of really interesting thoughts there. It sounds like you've got some personal experiences uh, where you were completely burned out, or you know, your your physical or mental health might have suffered due to overwork. Uh, and I have been for the last ten years a big fan of of Tim Ferriss and the Four Hour Work Week and some of those ideas, and I've tried to put those into practice over the years, but it's a constant battle in this industry, trying to figure out how to balance, uh, you know, again physical, mental, uh, personal health against being successful and hitting the targets you need to hit, uh, coping with the, the pressures that exist in this role. But, uh, you know, I guess, tell us how, how can we all elevate ourselves as sellers? Where do we start? Yeah, um, lots to unpack there. And a little bit about my personal story here is I, I'm still an active seller um, and I'm, I am active on LinkedIn because I got to a point where I was doing a lot of personal branding. I heavily believe in the power of LinkedIn, especially in the SaaS space, that you need to be there. You need to start have conversations. And you know, I've been successful in using LinkedIn to push uh, uh, not just my company's products, right, but bring a unique persona to that. But I got to a point where I was like, you know, I would maybe talk about making president's club and, and it became very eye-opening that actually the majority of my audience is not my prospects. They're actually fellow sellers. And right. so a couple of years ago, I started really pivoting to talking about my sales experience and my sales experience, you know, this probably sounds very familiar to many in the SaaS industry. You know, you, you have to hustle and grind, you work around the clock, you're told, hey, I've got to get up early because, hey, successful people get up at 4 a.m. or get started by 5 a.m. Right. And so you get up early and then you're, you're working, you're hyper reactive. You're mostly working in your inbox, right, to try to make sure that the deal is progressing or you're hyper responsive to, to clients. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you get that slump in the afternoon around 2 p.m., you get the the quad espresso latte at Starbucks. So you, you pound the Red Bull, you keep going, and then you, you work late and you're, you're exhausted, but you still kind of work on those final tweaks on the proposal late into the night and then you right. do it all over again. And that will bring success. You know, it, it will, but it's temporary. And that was a hard lesson for me because at, at, at one point in my early 30s, actually had an idiopathic stroke. Um, idiopathic meaning there's no known cause for it. I didn't have a hole in my heart. I was not using drugs. Um, that would be the typical reason why somebody would have a stroke at, hmm. at, at my age. Healthy wow. former athlete. I was running consistently at the time, working out. And the only thing that I could personally pin it to is I was you know, working around the clock, really grinding on little sleep, lots of caffeine. Mm -hmm. And that was eye opening for me, like being in the hospital, scaring the hell out of my wife yeah. you know, by my bedside. So that was, that was a, a big wake up call, like, whoa, wait a minute, I, I'm in the game of life. I'm again, a human first, a seller second, I need to figure out, um, you know, how to, to do this in a more sustainable way. So I just, you know, 
And this really came about too most recently with the pandemic. You know, we were kind of forced to operate in a, a different way. You know, uh, the rise of like mental health issues, mm-hmm. right? We're all kind of stuck in one place. Uncertainty, new business falling off a cliff and yeah. the pressures of being in sales. So um, what I found really over the past year and a half, couple of years is actually when I prioritized my health and I focused on things like sleep and I use wearables like Whoop to like really give me good insights into how mm. well I'm sleeping, how much I'm sleeping, how much sleep debt I'm in. Um, those actually started to become more powerful KPIs than activity KPIs that were traditionally measured on in sales. And so I started looking at that and I've, I've started like tracking it obsessively and started saying, okay, when my sleep debt is less than three week, three hours, I'm going to have a really strong day. I'm going to have a really strong week. And if I can sort of optimize my schedule around that, optimize my schedule around actually how many meetings I can actually avoid. Um, because mm. again, in strategic sales is you want to make an impact with a handful of accounts, not necessarily uh, spread yourself too thin. Right. So I wanted to be really strategic with deep work and actually reading the book Deep Work by Cal Newport was sort of eye-opening for me. Yeah. And so combining the, that sort of health data and prioritizing that and combining pockets of really focused deep work and getting in flow state um, and then kind of measuring my mood. Those are sort of the, like the three big tranches of, of data that I was looking at that really, uh, and then it, it proved to me, I was able to sell more in you know, operating this way over the past year than I did the previous three years leading up to that when I was sort of on a plane every week hustling and kind of you know, highly caffeinated on little sleep. Wow. And so just for the listeners, and this isn't, you know, a secret or anything like that, you post about your earnings. Uh, I saw a post the other day that over the last just a little under four years, you've cleared over 50 million in new revenue for your company, uh, which is fantastic. I know in the past you've posted your W2s for for some of your, you know, prior selling years. Uh, how So what is the journey to, to get to that point where you're able to, to get yourself into a conversation uh, that's, you know, a seven figure opportunity. A lot of my listeners are just starting out and they're probably in a more transactional selling role. Uh, and a lot of them have aspirations to get to where, you know, you are, which is strategic selling, getting those very large uh, transformation and enterprise deals done. Uh, what can, you know, listeners be doing now to sort of put themselves on that path towards being able to have those kind of conversations? Yeah, I was there, right? I, it wasn't too long ago. I was right. depressed and I was bankrupt. I was selling to these small bars in Florida, a little tiny piece of um, print advertising, right? Not a whole lot of respect, uh, nothing against that, but uh, you know, it wasn't like I was commanding respect from these business owners or even you know myself. So that was hard, right? It was it was definitely a journey, and um, nothing comes easy. Um, but no, right? I was in your shoes. So if you're listening to this and you you aspire to making seven figures a year, you aspire to being able to sell to Fortune ten level brands and sit across from a CEO and, and come up with some really creative ideas and solutions. Um, you can do it, right? Cause uh, there, I am not special. There's nothing mm-hmm. unique uh, so much to me genetically, um, you know, no college degree, you know, so it's, it is in your power and capability um, where I do think I have a unique advantage is my focus on a personal operating system and focusing more on the right outcomes, right? And the right process and focusing on what you can control and letting go of the things you cannot. So a bit of like stoic philosophy here. Um, And slowly and steadily, right? You can continue to parlay your expertise Again, to, to, to beat home that concept where humans first, seller second, take care of yourself, keep writing, you know, think of yourself as an author of your own story. What 
are you learning from your current role that and you can parlay? And once you've mm-hmm. exhausted that, how do you level up? Right. And that's yeah. what I continually, continually did. Um, and I was very strategic and deliberate about where did I go next? Right. And I eventually got to a place where, Hey, I'm going to retire. I'm going to retire early off of what yeah. I'm, I'm focused on. And now then I can parlay that into future success, owning my own time, become a solopreneur um, mm-hmm. based off of the, this brand that I'm building. But right now, I, you know, I kind of like a world-class athlete and a professional athlete. I want to like, you know, accomplish everything that I possibly can retire. Well, retire on, on a high note. And um, you can do that when you just take the right steps, get to a point where you can't go any further in your current role, and then mm-hmm. put yourself in a new position where you can expand, get the, the knowledge you need, get the experience you need, get the, the abundance you want to create for yourself until you just can't take it any further. Um, and then you start to, to look at the world in a highly different way. You start to look at money in a highly, you know, completely different way. Right. I view it as a tool, right, to unlock time freedom um, and and do the things that motivate me. Um, that's sort of like it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm I'm getting to to more towards the self actualization tip of the pyramid. Fantastic, that's great. A question for you. So, was there a moment in time or a specific deal cycle where you know, for lack of a better word, you stopped and said, "Holy shit." I'm on this path now to these large enterprise strategic, you know, vision oriented deals. Was there a specific deal cycle or a specific moment in time where you feel like it all just sort of clicked? And then you realize you were on this path towards where you are now, which is, you know, looking back at 50 million plus in closed revenues over a couple of years and, you know, just incredibly high earnings. Uh, to, if so, tell us about that deal cycle, uh, or maybe it wasn't just one moment in time. Maybe it was, uh, you know, over the course of, of some longer time frame where things started to fall into place, but I'd, I'd love to hear about that journey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for me, yeah, it definitely was a culmination of a lot of things. Looking back, you can, I could kind of see in my career how every little step, every little job, how everything was, worked out the way it was supposed to work out. It's hard to see that in the time, you know, at the time, um, because it can be really challenging and it's in, and you're in the weeds, but then when you take a step back and you look back, Oh, you know, like actually being a failed soccer player, actually learning how to DJ, uh, help me to read a crowd. Um, you know, as an athlete, I got the discipline I needed and then, you know, learning media advertising helped me to get into the technology industry. And then I was able to work with people who are running a business, right? And this means a lot to them. So I know how to relate to them to eventually get into mid-market and then technology, um, enterprise technology. So everything sort of just, the puzzle starts to come together. So just kind of know, right? If your intention is positive, you're focused on being the best person you can be and you really treat sales as a craft that you mm-hmm. respect, those things, everything's going to, I'm highly confident things are going to work out in your favor, even when you're, you're thrown a curveball in life and you're like, this seems to be putting me off course. This is devastating in the long arc of life, not to get too philosophical, you know, <laughs> things are going to work out the, the way they, they should, right? Just keep, keep focused on what you can control and stay positive. But the moment for me when I was like, wow, holy shit, uh, this <laughs> is the moment where I like, I don't want to say I've made it, but like I'm on a different level now that I always thought I could get to. It was actually the first deal at Live Person, um, and it was Delta Airlines. Um, so a couple things there to kind of point out: Live Person were a B to B to C company, and we work with you know really large brands and. Um, Delta was like on my radar as the number one brand I wanted to focus on. We didn't have an SDR team when I first joined in 2018. So I was like full cycle on this. And it was like on during onboarding my first two weeks, I was like, I built my pitch, right? We had to, to, to build a pitch and we had to pitch our, our conversational AI solutions to, to leadership as sort of the, the end part of our two week onboarding. And I used Delta as the use case. 
because mm-hmm. Delta had meaning to me personally. It was the brand that I was spending a lot of time on. It was on a plane like just about every other week. Um, I spent a lot of money for them, albeit expensed money, right? In my previous role and then into right. life person. And I, I talk about this story a lot. I wrote an open letter and in, you know, long story short, we got the deal done. Um, it was something that I put a lot of passion behind. I, I sort of showed my personal experience. I'm on your plane all the time. I would love it as a diamond medallion member if I could have these capabilities uh, that we have at, at Live Person that we're delivering to other brands. And um, yeah, won a multi-year seven-figure deal. And that really solidified to me of like, whoa, I can do this, right? I can do this with other Fortune 50 brands. Let's go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I uh, haven't looked back since. Uh, I want to dig in a little bit to the open letter. Uh, I don't know if you call it a tactic or just play, if you will. Do you, so do you just write that on a PDF and send it over? I, I've noticed you put those out on Medium. Is that how you send it to the executives at, at Delta or what's the format that works best? And this may be a really granular question, uh, but I think the, the takeaway here is that there's some of these very small nuances that you're obviously incredibly good at that managed to get the attention of the right people at, you know, a major U.S. airline. Um, and how did you think of that idea or, or did you learn that from working with someone else who deployed that same tactic? I'm so curious specifically about that open letter because I think it's such a, a unique way to get in the door. Yeah, um, you know, tactically, I look at it as a tool in a broader toolkit. And in some ways, Here's kind of the funny thing. I talk a lot about sales, but in some ways, I don't even consider myself a salesperson. I'm almost like a content creator that just happens to be or a high achiever in the sales world. And I've just made sales work for me. And I think that's an interesting thing because in some ways, we, we are all sellers, right? We have to sell ourselves, whether you're in an interview that... And you could be a, an engineer or a marketer. Right. You all have to sell yourself to, to somebody. Mm-hmm. So we're all in sales. And so what I wanted to always, and I didn't learn like the whole open letter concept from anyone else. It just sort of seemed like the natural thing to do. And again, it was just sort of like all this experience that I've had in previous roles. I sort of put it together in this unique way that just worked. And um. I always thought of myself as how do I differentiate myself? How can I be an an interesting content creator that gets people's attention that um, drives action? And so it's more of even like a marketing mindset. And so what I did um, just to get pretty granular on that specific um, play was I had just received my annual letter from the head of, of loyalty, right? Obviously it's a standard letter that everybody gets at Delta. If you get your, I, I think it was my um, Sky Club pass, my card in the mail. Mm-hmm. And there's a VP of loyalty. Um, I won't mention his name. Uh, he's actually since moved on from Delta, but um, I, I targeted this, this VP. And then I, I also targeted a handful of other VPs that I knew were relevant to what we we had to offer. And I just wrote a very short email, you know, right, to catch their attention. And then I, I kind of led to, um, hey, I love being a Delta uh, uh, Diamond Medallion member, which is the top mm-hmm. tier, the meaning I'm on your plane a lot. So I yeah. sort of got that credibility. I, you know, sent the photo of the letter and the card and said that I'm actually writing this from the Atlanta terminal, you know, terminal C and, you know, their home base and right. uh, built that credibility. And then basically said, but I have something to say, dot, dot, dot. And then I, I sent, and then I had a link to a medium, the, the blogging sites at the time, mm-hmm. it just seemed to be the best place to host it because you could host it privately, not publicly. Publicly. Okay. And it drove them to Medium where I had a broader open letter. And I also um, did a PDF of that letter for any reason if they were blocked, right? Um, I also had the open letter as a PDF as an attachment. So I kind of covered my basis. And then I was using 
you know, this is sort of pre-outreach. So I was using Yesware to sort of track the, the analytics oh, yeah. and the opens. Yeah. So that's kind of the, you know, what worked. And the open letter was basically showing them, hey, I'm one of your top customers. Um, and oh, by the way, I just happen to be working with a company who has a solution. You don't offer messaging, um, you, you know, between a brand and a consumer. You offer it, you know, for free when you're mm-hmm. connected to the Wi-Fi. But why can't I message you when I need to change a flight or I need right. help with something? And then that started a nine-month journey to wow. closing closing the deal. That I, I think it's such an interesting, and I just love the approach of being so personal and really, I mean, you reached out to someone as a customer uh, and you reached yeah. out to their head of loyalty They're you know, they're probably one of the highest executives on the loyalty side of their business. And you're really just sharing an experience, but offering, uh, you know, offering up an opportunity to make a trans, uh, you know, transformation, a change. Uh, I really, really, I've been digging myself into that style of outreach and prospecting and trying to get more strategic about the, the work that I'm doing and really trying to uncover where, you know, I can add the most value. And I, that's so, so interesting. And then do you always do it in, in the written word or have you ever done, you know, video or audio bites over to, to prospects or do you just kind of choose the channel that you're most uh, confident with? How to, tell us about that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, things have evolved since 2018. I think video is a much more powerful um, way, right? Um, and sometimes you just have to mix it up, you know, so it's it's not just one all or, or nothing uh, type of approach. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm more of a writer, right, than, than being on video, but definitely video can can be powerful, right, when, when done in the right way, um, you know, just like writing, there's, there's, you know, the right way and the wrong way to do anything in life. And, and this is true too, with like opening the door, right? So, you know, having good copy, having like good context, understanding, personalizing and making it, making it, you know, catch uh, their attention, keeping it short, you know, all those things, right? There's all the tactical things and the technical things you have to do, right? But yeah, I think video, there's definitely a, a case for video being, uh, you know, more powerful, but, you know, also everybody's jumped on the bandwagon, right? So it can be tough to, to stand out with that vidyard on, uh, on your in-mail, right? When mm-hmm. they're also, you know, bouncing between meetings and maybe they have it on their second monitor and they click on it and they're like, oh, I have to watch a video, you know, might not be the right time for me to watch this because I'm in a meeting, right? right? when the written word could have been, um, you know, better. So quickly conceived. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You you have to sort of, you know, just balance it out and again, be a, almost like treat yourself like a content creator. You know, we're all putting on different hats, different, dependent on different times of the sales cycle. So, Mm -hmm. you know, experimenting is, is definitely using curiosity and you can using the data to, um, you know, tweak, your, your strategy uh, is, is absolutely something you have to do, right? That's a part of the personal operating system. Right. Walk us through how you do research on your prospecting accounts. Uh, is there a, you know, sort of start to finish operating system you have specifically for that? Does it vary depending on the company? I'd be curious to learn, you know, how you think about doing the right research. Cause obviously, even though you were a customer of Delta, Uh, and you had that context, you probably still additionally did some research on their business, uh, where you could add the most value, where you could solution sell into, you know, the right people there. Yeah. How do you research your prospects? Well, the good thing is being in B to B to C, right. Versus Mm -hmm. just B to B and you can still do this in B to B, but it's, I don't want to say easier. It's just, it's, um, more logical, right. In B to B to C, because we can be those customers. Um, yeah. I, you know, sold a deal, really large deal to Chipotle, for instance, that's a fun, that was a fun brand to work with. And, mm-hmm. um, also somebody I'm happy to be a customer with. So yeah, I was going to say how many burritos, yeah. Yeah. uh, <laughs> can you quantify burritos to sales dollars? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it, it is much easier in, in when you're dealing with the B2C brand to be that customer and understand, right, as a customer where the breakpoints are. And so when you do research, right, you can create a template that you and your SDR uh, can, can work through of like, oh, have we tried this, 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 and this, 
right? Very easy to kind of go through that checklist. Okay, we have something here. We can weave a story together. So my diamond standard, as I call it, is because this information is so easily accessible, take the time, so deep work, right? Use part of the personal operating system is instead of going back to back to back to calls, find the time right before your first call to know the customer experience better than the person you're talking to or meeting with. And if you kind of go through that checklist, you're going to arm yourself with highly credible stuff is, Hey, I'm your customer. You can confidently and authentically say that. And here's the experience I had, you know, is it worth exploring where, you know, is, is, is this top of mind for you? And and so you could get into more of a, a natural conversation versus mm-hmm. trying to pitch something or pitch features. We, we know that's just not the way to lead. You got to lead to your company. You got to lead to the, the, the solution. And really for me, I'm leading to more of a transformation. That's how I can get top dollar for, uh, for, for what we're offering. That's great. No, that's super, super interesting. And I totally agree. It's much easier when you can go and shop the brand. That's what I, you know, at a previous employer, we used to call it shopping the brand. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah, when you're selling into retailers or airlines or restaurants, it's uh, fairly, you know, low barrier to go and test out the customer experience yourself, whether that's online or even in person. Uh, but that's super interesting. And I think a great, great strategy for really humanizing the sale too. It's not just about, uh, you know, transacting. It's really about transforming. Yeah. And I'll take it a step further too. You know, I created something I called like the diamond account framework and Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a Venn diagram because I think it's also important when like, again, you elevate your career at the top of the pyramid, right? You're, you're a strategic seller. You're selling SaaS. You are in a position to be hyper strategic with your time and energy are two most precious resources. You want your time and energy to deliver the highest return. So I got to a point where it was like coming out of 2019, well, actually coming out of 2018, my first full year, I've closed Delta, I closed another big uh, account, um, paid really well coming into 2019, which kind of contributed yeah. to that first seven figure year. Mm-hmm. I deliberately slowed down in order to speed up. We get caught up in, in sales often as like, oh, every lead, oh, that's mine, right? I don't want anybody else to have it. Or like, you know, we get very territorial. The best thing you can do actually is give that up. It's not only good for your company, but you mm-hmm. like you start to become hyper focused because you're treating this almost like your own business. And when you can be strategic with your time and your energy, that helps to to craft the right motivation to keep you going. So you almost want to personally align yourself culturally to the right targets. That's what's going to help you to be really focused, right? If I knew nothing about another airline, right? Like a JetBlue, for instance, nothing against JetBlue, but it would have been harder work because right. I'm not on their plane every week or, you know, it, you know again, nothing against... Popeyes, right? But you know, a little bit harder because I don't eat at Popeyes. You know, especially as a vegetarian, not not much for me to talk about, <laughs> right? But Chipotle, right? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm all about it. So, you know, and and so I came up with this framework. It's like a Venn diagram that, and then in you know, in the middle of the diagram, in these circles, you're coming up with your diamond accounts. And so I mm-hmm. created like five criteria that are important to me. And, um, and then I think that framework can be used for, for anyone. Um, so at, at the end, we can share like how to, to get in touch with me and I can share all of these, these playbooks for free with, with people and the, these assets. Um, but that worked really well kind of going into 2019 because then I had a handful of accounts that I could really double down on, spend high quality time with that I already knew a lot about as, as an existing customer and it just made the relationship, it made the experience enjoyable. Literally, it was like more enjoyable. Like when you, you know, we were pre-pandemic and traveling a lot, right? That can be exhausting. Right. So showing up, right, across the country and spending time with it, I actually wanted to do that um, because these were accounts that I was really excited about. I was, yeah, I was totally going to ask, is that diamond framework hosted somewhere? And we can get into that towards the end as far as how to get in touch, but I'm excited to take a look at that myself. 
Yeah. Yeah. Happy to share it. Yeah. It's, it's a digital asset that I, I offer for free. Awesome. Uh, so I have a question around, you know, you, you posted something a while back that I thought was really interesting. And it said something along the lines of if you work in, you know, SaaS sales or strategic sales to a certain point, you sort of sell yourself out of a job. And if I recall the point you were making is that you might at some point in a SaaS selling career, reach a threshold where you can tell yourself, you know, again, holy shit, I could be self-employed uh, and I can create, you, you know, assets and resources. And there's, you know, this skill set really lends itself to being an entrepreneur, uh, you know, being a founder, being a creator. Uh, so the question that I have around that is, you know, from here, what's, what's your next move? Where do you see the next couple of years? You're really kind of at the pinnacle of, of SaaS selling. And, you know, I'm sure you could be perfectly happy staying in the role you're in and, you know, continuing to sell into strategic brands and serving customers that way. Uh, but I'm curious if, you know, there's, there's an entrepreneurship play ahead and what you see the next few years of your career looking like. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> um, that's, yeah, I think you get to a point, like I said, it, it becomes less about the money. And again, everybody's different, right? Um, you know, I liken sales a lot to professional sports, but it, it could be any craft. It could be, you know, art, it could be music, it could be acting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to do it for as long as possible, as long as you're loving it. Um, and I, I certainly enjoy what I do. But there came a point where I viewed it's not just about the money. Um, right. Some figures a year is great, right? But you know, as I started engaging with more and more sellers out there, um, it became very clear, like I can use talking about money as a hook because that's very easy. You know, it's not clickbait. It's just, it Everyone just- Everyone thinks it, about it. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. We're, we're such a money, well, well one, you know, in, in general in societies in the Western world, usually money generate, you know, money obsessed, but, but also right. in sales, this is how we're measured. Mm -hmm. um, so we can even look at somebody's W-2, then it, it shows, well, wow, the person's successful. What are they doing that's uniquely different? And so deconstructing that has been just an amazing, fun, enjoyable process. And kind of once you see the path to solopreneurship or moving from entrepreneurship, which is really sales, you're using the infrastructure of somebody else to build a business to full-on entrepreneurship. It's hard to unsee that, and, and and that's where I am. And and honestly, you know, full transparency, um, I will retire um, from the corporate space in the next twelve to to fourteen months. Um, that's the oh, plan. Wow. I, I plan to retire by forty three, and and then parlay that into my own venture. And right now, mm -hmm. be focused, live great is it's a side project, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I I do see very clearly a path where we will create products to help other sellers along this journey. What did I learn um, around earning seven figures and then repeating um, and staying in the seven figure earners club? And then again, what I've learned is it, then it becomes once you reach that milestone, it's not about the money. It's, it's, you know, how can you build a personal brand and how do you leverage LinkedIn? How do you go from 6,000 followers or 2,000 followers to, 15,000, 50,000 yeah. followers. And then how do you can, how can you then leave the corporate world behind and own hundred percent of your time freedom and become a solopreneur. So that's sort of the path and we'll build products and services. Um, and, and a lot of that actually will, will connect, connect into AI. I, I believe in this uh, human connection and partnership with AI um, mm -hmm. that, that will help you to, to sort of do that. And, and so that's, that's the plan. Thank you for sharing that 12 to 14 months. That is incredible. And I'm, yeah, I'm very excited that you're building something. Uh, I, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm passionate about this stuff too. Hence the, the podcast, right. Is I was looking for other creative outlets, things that could work in tandem with what I do by day. Uh, and that can, you know, can serve, I'm serving audiences that I don't typically, you know, serve in my nine to five, if you will. 
so I, I'm, you know, just a geek for this stuff. And I love hearing uh, about others that are, again, building something for the longer term. And uh, that's super exciting. By 43, you're going to be retired, you know, tentatively, it sounds like, but uh, hopefully retired and, and running, you know, a passion business and, you know, working on your terms. Not that you probably aren't already, but just, you know, fully, fully able to, to self-actualize, uh, you know, in, in, in something that you're, you know, dedicated in and, and serving the stakeholders that you want to serve. I love that. Uh, and I'm very, very excited to, to continue hearing more about how that develops over the next, uh, you know, 12 to 14 months. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. Well, uh, Brandon, uh, tell us how we can get in touch with you. My listeners want to follow your content. They want to learn how to do what you do. Where can we find you? Uh, what's the best way to, to get in touch if, if, uh, if we need to? Yeah. So I really kind of offer, I think, value. And right now it's free. And I, I, I welcome everybody to take advantage of those free assets and learnings. Um, first and foremost, LinkedIn. Uh, Brandon Fluharty, just follow me there. Um, that's I, as you see Jesse, uh, twice a day during the week and then once on the weekends. Um, so there's a lot of great insights that I think people can, can follow and, and share and, and gain, you know, really valuable insights on the second piece is I offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, obviously I have to respect my time as, as somebody busy, um, in a, in a highly stressful job and building something interesting with be focused, live great. Um, but you can text me directly and you can text the keyword mentor to the number 917-810-2325. And that will pull up some time to actually connect with me one-on-one -on -one, um, for free for a half hour. And we can really talk about anything that you want. Um, and then I share some VIP insights through that texting community. And then the, th the third piece is um, I offer a biweekly newsletter. Um, on brandonfluhardy.com and you can uh, get, get the newsletter there. Um, and then actually there is a fourth piece on my side project. If you're really interested in going down the rabbit hole um, on befocusedlivegreat.com, um, you can apply to be sort of one of the founding members um, and, and you kind of go through a process there uh, where cool. we, we want to find like-minded individuals who kind of want to build something from the ground up together. Um, so you can apply there at befocusedlivegreat.com. Um, and then brandonfluhardy.com is, is the easiest place to just sign up for the, the, the newsletter. And we're going to be sharing our first product later this year, seven steps to earning seven figures in SaaS sales. Uh, anybody who, who's a part right. of the newsletter will get that for free before the, the end of the year. Yeah, I just recently subscribed to the newsletter and can can say I'm really enjoying it. It's it's valuable content that's highly relevant to to SaaS selling. Uh, SaaS selling. So, I will post some of these links in the show notes. Uh, and Brandon, I can't thank you enough for coming on, sharing your wisdom with the audience uh, and myself. And uh, yeah, keep up the great work. Yeah, this was great, Jesse. Thanks for having me on. Yeah.